Working Fans Podcast. Cool. Yep. All right, here we go. Coming down three, two. Welcome back for another week of the Working Fans Podcast. This is AJ. I'm the former wrestler. We've got Dave, the ultimate fan, here with us. As we do every week, our producer, Joe, may likes to make us sound good and makes us look way more professional than we actually are. As always, you can find us on Twitter. That's at Fans Working. Facebook, Working Fans Pod. We've got email where you can reach out to us and please contact us to let us know what you think of the podcast and for any ideas that you might have. That's WorkingFansWrestlingPod at gmail.com. We're on Instagram where you can keep up with us at WorkingFansWrestling underscore pod. And then you can now listen to us on all major platforms including Anchor.fm. We're on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Apple Podcasts, and you can actually check us out on YouTube. Now, it's important when you go onto the Apple Podcasts and YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a rating, let us know what you think so you can help us out and we can continue to do what we love and bring you guys in as fans. All right, everybody, it's the Working Fans Podcast with the man they call Dave and Mr. AJ Strange Brew. And today we're going to talk... Uh, all right. Well, I I don't know what song Strange Brew sounds like, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hit that yet. He's as big as a boat and as strong as a cat. I'm sorry. That was god awful. Slam Jam album called back. No, they didn't because they suck. All right. I don't know when we're gonna end up airing this, but me and you were talking about Randy Orton the other day through text. We we're talking about the greatest match of all time, or. So it was Bill Des, which I did enjoy the match, by the way. He wanted to talk about Randy Orton today, and I had said something before we went that I wanted to talk about Randy Orton too, but I wanted to have a little sidebar about this match that he had just had with Edge. And I enjoyed it. I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed the little things they did. and But what really was kind of like interesting to me was I realized that the WWE... Like, the greatest match of all time wasn't just, like, a dumb way to build this match with bad expectations. In WWE's mind, I felt like this was, like, a concept. Almost like they were taking elements. Like, there was a room of people said, let's just get together and what would you have in the greatest match? Oh, drop the mic down like MSG. Have Howard Finkel's voice. Have blood, pal. You know, like, all these, like, things to them that were probably be, like, elements of a good match for us. It was almost like they sat around the room and like, hey, let's just throw these wacky things out there that people like. They like that wrestling. I don't know. I don't know what you thought about it. First of all, I'm going to be complimentary to Edge and Randy Orton. I think they did a great job. They did. Uh, especially, especially when you take into consideration the fact that Edge tore his tricep in the middle of the match. Yes. I think they did an absolutely wonderful job for a guy who was off for nine years and, and obviously Randy Orton is always extremely talented. Mm-hmm. Well, that being said... I think it was a way to almost mock the smart fans. Mm. I think that they were taking all these things that the smart fans always say, make up a great match like you said. Yeah. And I think that they were basically saying, all right, you think you know what the greatest match is. We're going to take everything you complain about not seeing and put it into one match. Yeah, I think we're kind of on the same page. I'm not taking it as malicious. I'm taking it more as like, they just... There's people, and I think it's Vince McMahon, who view wrestling as something goofy. <laughs> you know, like, oh, we're making movies, but yeah, let's yeah. do that goofy wrestling and, that they seem to like. And I see how you would take that as not malicious, mm. but as somebody who uh, loves the purity and uh, that style of wrestling, I take it as a slap in the face that Vince McMahon, once again, is flipping up the bird and <laughs> saying... Yeah, enjoy the ball in one match, but I'm not giving it to you again. <laughs> I just look at the intent. I think the intent is like, he just views it as like, I don't know. It's a narrow scope. It's a very narrow-minded scope. But let's talk about Randy Orton. Let's talk about him. Wait a minute. First, first of all, let's talk about Charles Robinson. I love the fact they dressed him like the old MSG referee. That's fantastic. Yeah, that was good. That was good. I like the... Uh, wrestling like when edge was going for the deep arm drags and then randy was a little smart and he countered him and you know they had a good back and forth match yeah 
But now we can talk about Randy Orton. Yeah, let's talk about Randy Orton. You know, it's funny. He recently got into it with Tomasa Ciampa on Twitter. And he had said something about after the In Your House Takeover event. He said, I heard they're having a hell of a show. I bet there was a lot of thigh slapping or something along those lines. And then... In fairness, he didn't get into it with Tomasa Ciampa. He got into it with NXT and Tomasa Ciampa, being a leader in NXT, picked up the baton and went after Randy Orton. He sure did. He sure did. He sure did. And I'm not even getting... I always wanted to point out the comment because when we're talking about Randy Orton, this guy is somewhat of a one of the original trolls. And if you notice, when he hit the punt, he actually slapped his leg <laughs> in the match. And I just thought to myself, I wonder, I just wonder if that was a shot. And and by the way, Randy's not taking just a shot of NXT. He might have mentioned NXT by name, but he's gone after independent wrestlers before and a lot of wrestlers who basically do a lot of high spots and leg slapping. Randy has a, he's an old school mentality in the ring. Now let's be fair to Randy Orton. How many world championships does Randy Orton have? 13? Uh, I was going to say 12, 13. So yeah, around there. So we've got a 13 time world champion who on a daily basis is probably one of the, how can I put this? He is probably one of those underrated wrestlers by wrestling fans. Mm -hmm. He is overlooked constantly. Sure. People talk about his lack of effort, his lack of passion. They talk about how he doesn't get along with people. Mm -hmm. He's got a really bad reputation with wrestling fans. And I think that we have a tendency of being hard on him and taking him for granted because he's one of the best wrestlers, in my opinion, of his generation. He's a multifaceted individual. I mean, there are stuff where... We've seen Randy just flip out on people, and he maybe doesn't take this seriously all the time. I mean, watch the Ruthless Aggression documentary. It's the one where they profile Evolution, and they were thinking about having Mark Jindrak in the Evolution group, and him and Randy, who were younger at the time, were basically in a limo, and Triple H was there with Ric Flair, and Triple H said they were fine, separate, but he says you put them in the car together, and they were acting like kids, they were making animal noises, and I was ready to throw them both out of the car. I remember looking at Rick and saying, hold on, I said, did you and Harley do this? What the hell is this? You know? But he was much younger. In fairness, mm -hmm. Randy Orton and Mark Indrock also weren't traveling down the road throwing beer bottles at each other, racing cars side by side, <laughs> trying to run each other off the road. It's a different level of immaturity, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, that and the fact that Harley and Rick, by the time they got together... Neither one of them are 20 years old. Right, yeah, different. And that's actually something I was going to bring up is Randy's youth. I think for me personally, one of the problems I've had with Randy over the years is that his character's gotten a bit stale. But if you look at that, if you look at all his title reigns, he's also the youngest world champion of all time. So he's kind of the first victim, I think, of overexposure in a lot of ways. When WCW went out and WWE just started putting more and more content out there, Randy and John Cena... They relied heavily on these two, and they were main eventing pay-per-view after pay-per-view after pay-per-view, and I think that's part of the issue we've had over the years with his character. But if you look at Randy Orton in the ring, man, I don't think of any time this guy's ever hurt anybody. See, I look at this a slightly different way. I'm looking at this that, yeah, him and Cena had to go on pay-per-view after pay-per-view, but part of the reason why was because The Rock left. Batista left. Sure. Angle left to go to other places. Then Watt killed his family. Eddie Guerrero died. Yes. All of a sudden, what did you have other than Cena and Randy Orton and Triple H? Uh, what did you have? So they had to be the carriers of the WWE for a short time, and that's why we saw hmm. so much Cena versus, same thing with Edge versus Orton. Yeah, and, time, as much as and a lot of this guy's stuff. Orton, for a long time, if you had heard, oh, here comes another Orange Edge match, how pissed off would you have been? Yeah, and the thing is, too, though, but like, a lot of this guy's stuff has air out publicly, too. I mean, you know, he's an emotional, he would, well, he was. I mean, I don't know, there's a, I think Randy's grown up in some ways, in certain aspects. Oh, he has definitely grown up. Yeah, in certain aspects of his life. I think uh, he'll be the first to tell you he's not always a nice guy, but... Like, I remember Randy, there was that famous spot years ago where he had kind of cut Kofi Kingston's push a little bit, some would say, when he's yelling at him, calling him stupid in the middle of the ring when a spot blew. Or when Ken Kennedy had and, apparently messed up a spot and, and Randy and, Orton. And, and Ferris, both of those instances, 13 years ago. 
Right, right. And that's my point, actually, is that, you know, he's had a chance to go. So we saw a lot of this stuff air out when he was much younger. Different individual, different man now. But the performer, Randy Orton, I don't remember him ever hurting anybody. And, you know, when he no, wants to he deliver. He has been hurt by others. He has been. He has been. And, you know, and I think he's a very smooth in that ring. Like, that's the common thing that a lot of the guys who have worked with Randy is they'll say that, He's, he's a guy that doesn't have to really try that hard. He makes it look easy. I want to look at this from a slightly different angle. Do you think one of the reasons why he had problems when he was younger with the maturity, do you think one of the problems was because it came so natural to him that maybe he didn't understand why other people would struggle? Could be. You know, and it's like anything, too. When things come easy to you, you probably don't always appreciate it as much as you probably should. You know, you got to kind of work for it. And that could be a factor, too. And, you know, let's say something else, too, about Randy. At the end of the day, you know, and maybe he's had his issues with putting over Young Town in the past. But it was just a couple of years ago this guy put over Ginger Mahal, you know. So, so he's definitely, I think, we got to look at a big picture with Randy. That, that's kind of my point is he's kind of been around for a very long time. So it's hard to compare 21-year-old Randy Orton to the Randy Orton we see now. I also don't think that people get the fact that when he mentions some of these other things, that that's actually his way of giving them the rub. Hmm. I mean... If that makes any sense whatsoever. I mean, I... He's looking at... Good. I think to a point he's looking at it as, I can give these guys the rub by mentioning them and actually giving them a platform. I mean, there's definitely times where, uh, you know, it, it's hard to say with Randy. He's definitely had his moments where... Uh, <laughs> He's definitely he's he's an interesting guy. I, I I don't think he's I don't think he's as cut and dry as black and white as some people we may talk about. I, I don't think he's even remotely. I think from one day to the other, and he admits this. Yeah. He actually was on Corey Gray's podcast, and he is very clear about the fact that if he had the hunger of a Kurt Angle or a John Cena or God knows where he could have been. Mm. He says, at the end of the day, though, he enjoys being home with his family more than he does wrestling. And as much as he loves wrestling, he will never have that drive that those other guys have. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. yeah, he's an interesting performer. I can see where he rubs people the wrong way. And he's not a guy, he's an alpha. You get that vibe right away. He's not a guy that's going to tiptoe around you if he makes you uncomfortable. He's had. Hey, there was something that's very important I want to talk about with Randy Horace now. Okay. You mentioned earlier about his um, character going stale. I think he's better right now than he's ever been. Well, yeah, I would agree with that. When I say his characters, I mean for most of his career, up until this very recent point, I think he's on a really good run right now as of this recording. Like, this stuff... Did you see Monday Night with Christian? I did, and the stuff, I was going to say with Edge, but, and now just recently he pulled off with Christian. Very good. Like, I'm particularly... Why, he made it? out Christian at the end, and he's just yelling, I didn't want to do this. You made me do this. I would have took care of you, but it came down to me or you. It's going to be me. You had to go. I'm sorry. You made me do this. That was fantastic, even the way he called him into it, by saying, hey, it's okay if you don't do this. We all know you've always been a coward. Right, right, yeah. You know what's funny was Big Show in that element, who was like, hey, 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 I'm not telling you not to do it. At the end of the day, I'd wipe a smile off his face. And I thought, well, maybe you're just not really helping Big Show. Maybe he doesn't need to be doing this. Maybe you should not. Not, not only is he not helping things, <laughs> he's forgetting the fact seven foot two and 340 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, also, it was kind hey, of. Hey, Chris, he's twice the size of Randy Orton. I heard Randy uh, Orton. I think I heard it on Force <laughs> Wrestling or somewhere. I brought it up the fact that, uh, you know, there was a little logic missing in this, too, where it was like, oh, we can just have an unsanctioned match. Damn it all. Why didn't Daniel Bryan do this the last several years? All he had to do was ask Randy. We could have just had an unsanctioned match. The problem solved. <laughs> but Also, Ric Flair, who looked like he was half dead, mm. was able to leave the ring and somehow get in the ring fast enough to low blow them. I'm not saying they may have done some editing here, but how the fuck did Rick Flair get back in the ring that fast? I mean, I didn't know if Rick got all the way out of the ring. It was live. Like no, they show, yeah, they show him all the way out of the ring. 
I'd have to go back and watch it. I thought Rick only got partially out of the ring. But yeah, maybe there was creative editing. Because who knows what live really is right now these days. Is that going to be the last heel moment of Ric Flair's career? I don't know. I mean, again, we're taping this. I don't know when this will air. But it's kind of because they just had a thing with the coronavirus hitting one of the uh, developmental talents. And like we were talking about before this podcast, we realized that WWE hasn't even been testing <laughs> for the coronavirus this whole time. And now we're finding out they bring an old man Ric Flair back. They're not letting people wear masks in the building. Some things have been said. It's like, what the fuck are you doing, WWE? <laughs> so, hopefully... Well, AEW mm-hmm. has been testing people the whole time. Oh, yeah. And by the way, I'm not, like... I want to make this perfectly clear. AEW, the UFC... Like, I don't know. As much as I'm happy these guys are all running shows... I can't tell you that, like, pro wrestling needs to be back and that there needs to be actual people out in the stands. However, I'm glad that there is, and at least they're taking precaution. And the main thing is AEW... If they told me that I could go to a live show tomorrow, I would be there. Oh, yeah, me too. But I I get why. I'm saying in the big scheme of things, I don't know if it should be, you know? But, I mean... Me and, all, me and you we, aren't exactly the we, people that are going to back down from this kind of thing either. I'm hanging out with my friends still once in a while, you know? Well, in fairness, in fairness, today was the first day I could go back to the gym, and what was the very first thing I did? I went out and got a strength coach, and I'm back in the gym. Right, right. right. <laughs> Let's get back to Randy Orton, though. Yeah. At the end of the day, Randy Orton was the Underrated, I mean, he's one of the most underrated wrestlers out there because there's a big thing now, too, where people online in particular, I'm going to kind of generalize here a little bit, but they, if they don't like you, they don't want to give credit to you. I'll use WWE as an example for this. If WWE and the majority of us do feel like they're not putting out a good product, when they do something good, they won't necessarily get credit for it. And that's just the way it is. Like, people don't just view things like that. I'll even go a little political here. We don't do political on this show. But Randy had some tweets about the Black Black Lives Matter movement, where he said basically along the lines that, I'm embarrassed to say that it took me a while to get here, but I understand it. Black lives have to matter first because they haven't. Now, that's Randy's tweet. And Randy's point was that it took him a while to get to where he needed to to understand this. But after listening and talking to other fellow performers and other African-American people, he was on board. Now, here's my point. In the comments on some of this stuff, there was a lot of people that were like, oh, way to go, Randy, good to see you. But there was also people like, this guy's a snake, once a snake, always a snake. I don't... People just don't want to give credit to people, whether it's as a performer, whether it's a human being. Oh, no, there's a group of people out there that absolutely hate Randy Orton. Right, and so they won't give him any credit. And I think that part of that, yeah, he's underrated for part of that. Because at the end of the day, again, I said in the beginning, I thought his character was stale at times. But I'd be blind to say this guy as an in-ring performer isn't smooth in the ring and can't get it done. We can talk about one thing as simple as can be. We did a 5-3-1 a few months back, and the 5-3-1 that we did was best drop kicks in wrestling. Yep. I don't think any of us mentioned Randy Orton. Randy Orton is six foot five, 250, 60 pounds, and throws a drop kick like AJ Styles. I believe I mentioned Randy Orton, <laughs> but that's okay. What? what? Like None I said, of us did, though. None of us that. mentioned Randy Orton. <laughs> <laughs> I remember thinking I'm the only guy with this motherfucker on the list, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> like you said, people on the internet, when they don't like people, just don't listen to anything they say. <laughs> right. now, I always remember that, even like when he started, when he was having matches with Bob Holly and some of his first matches on SmackDown when he came to WWE, that he had a really good drive. Drop kick because Bob always had a good drop kick. So it's just something I noticed. He has a really good power slam back in the day. The draping DDT. He has a pretty good move set that he's gotten over and he's gotten fans used to when uh, they know his moves are coming. You know, and that, I think that's an art too is getting certain moves over. You know, people will talk about. He makes like, it, well, I think he does something that we talked about with Mister Perfect. 
he makes it look too easy. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. He's so fluent, he makes it look too easy. So once again, we question, how hard is he trying? Mm -hmm. What is he doing? I know you're not a baseball guy. Baseball fans that are listening to this will get what I'm saying. He's like J.D. Drew. There was a baseball player for the Cardinals and the Red Sox years ago who had every skill in the world, but because he always looked lackadaisical because he did everything so easily, everybody questioned his heart, questioned his ability to do it, and I think Randy Orton falls into this. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, at the end of the day, too, it's like, also, like, he hasn't done himself necessary favors at times, too. I was actually watching uh, a video before we talked about this today about 10 times Randy Orton broke character. But some were nice, like he checked on Shane McMahon's kids one time when Shane took a bad fall. But there was another... There was the another one at time. the end of the match where he's supposed to be hurt? No, uh, it was like in the middle of it. Randy had snuck over and let it, let his kids know that he was fine. But the thing was, like, one of the main ones was, uh, and probably the worst example, because a lot of the other ones were understandable, but this one was this. Randy was on, like, a TV camera, basically talking to the fans. You could see, he's like, are we off the air? Are we off the air? <laughs> yeah, that's the one that I was talking about, the one where he's, where he's supposed to be telling an injury, and oh. he's going... Are we off the air? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, I thought, you, yeah, I was mentioning the one with Shane. He didn't do that until that was still in the match. But yes, yes, he did. <laughs> so, again, he has, he's given me kind of, you know, he's, he's, he's made himself in a position to not be well-liked. And he has shown at times that he doesn't give a fuck. So, therefore, it's real easy for people who don't like him to point out things, especially in today's culture. However... Because of that, yes, I would say he is underrated, but also, like, at the end of the day, like, I'm not, although, like I said, I'm going to agree with you here a little bit. I am actually, I am I have been enjoying the work he does lately, but for the most well, part, gonna, throughout his career, if I'm you gonna, make a pie chart, I even have to say his career and his character has been stale. Uh, you, This is where me and you might disagree. I would say like maybe seventy percent of the time. Like I just I've not been a big fan overall of his character, but none of that takes away from what he does in the ring and in ring bell to bell. Son of a bitch can go. Go ahead, Adam. So I'll tell you my opinion. My opinion, real quick, and then I'm going to ask you a question. I think it's when he's a baby face that he's stale. I think heel Randy Orton when they let him be the legend killer is when he's at his best because people want to hate him. I think when they make him into a baby face, they, they make him the opposite of what we love about Randy Orton. I'm going to so, agree so with here's, some of that. I think he's a better heel than baby face. Let's put it that way. But, but I'm going to ask you a question. Go ahead. So to wrap this up, talking about Randy Orton, obviously he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah. yeah 13-time world champ. WWE loves him. In the fans' eyes, and this is just a question, simple question, do you think Randy Orton has hurt himself more, or do you think the opinions of the fans have hurt him more? God, that's tough. I would say. Do you think it's the smart? Do you think it's the smart wrestling fans that have hurt him more, or do you think it's his himself? I mean, at the end of the day, it was his self that started some of this. However, we also need to throw in some WWE booking, too. They also aren't totally off the hook here, too. So, yeah, I'm going to say it's a pretty equal share to blame because at the end of the day, too, the fans, they're just not going to give this guy a second chance too much. Although, I will say this. He also does have his core fans. How many uh, videos of people are sending out there of that RKO, RKO out of nowhere? You know, so he does have oh, no, his fans, people that, Yeah. There are people that very much love him. Yeah. So, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day, he's just going to be that polarizing guy that some people love and some people love to hate. But at the end of the day, I think me and you are going to agree on this. And I hope that a lot of people out here do, too. The motherfucker can go in the ring. Oh, absolutely. Anybody who's ever, who says that he can't work or anything like that just doesn't understand what it's like to work in the fucking ring. Yeah, he's part of my French. He's 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 a hell of a talent. Right. I don't I don't cuss much. I don't cuss much, <laughs> but I get a little um excitable when we talk about these keyboard warriors who say somebody can't work who's that good in the ring. Hundred percent, hundred percent. All right, I think that's it. Anything else you want to add? No.
Welcome back to the Working Fans Podcast. We are joining you special today because, Dave, there's there was some big news coming out of last night's final Last Ride episode. Is that correct? Yeah. The Undertaker has basically said that he's, for now, a very comfortable fallen in a career. He believes he's done. And he did say that he never knows that if, you know, Vince absolutely needed him in case of emergency break glass. But he's happy and he's content the way his career ended. So for those who haven't been watching, Scott basically goes back and forth on how to end his career. As Triple H says in the documentary, he's constantly facing that dragon, you know, that final good match. And then if the match isn't his perfect ending, he'll have another one. So basically this all got really bad for him after the Goldberg match in Saudi Arabia. Goldberg got concussion in the match, and he doesn't blame Bill Goldberg or anybody. He just doesn't want to think it happened. But when that happened, Goldberg goes to the jackhammer, almost breaks on the Taker's neck. Absolutely brutal. You can see it more in a documentary. And after that, Undertaker is thinking, okay, I almost, you know, could have died. I could have been paralyzed. My wife wouldn't have had a husband. My kids wouldn't have been without a dad. I don't know if I want to be doing this. And so he had a tag match scheduled for Extreme Rules in Philadelphia that year. And uh, it went really well. It was him and Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre and Shane McMahon. And it was in Philadelphia. The crowd was hot for it. Worked out well. And he said it almost worked out too well. But you see at the end of this, he's telling Vince, he's like, I think that'll be it. And Vince is like, yeah, yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk. <laughs> you know, Vince is almost like, uh, kind of like, you know, don't tell, tell me what we're doing yet, Mark. We'll figure it out. But then Vince says, well, I'll follow your lead. And he did that Stone Cold Broken Skull rant interview for the network. Yep, that was a good one. And then AJ Styles heard it, and AJ's like, he sounded like he had half his foot in and half his foot out, so I figured i just call him, because if he doesn't want to do the match, then it doesn't really matter what Vince said. So he says, it can't hurt to ask. So he approached Undertaker about doing a match with my mate. Taker's like, man, if you had called me 10 years ago, I would have totally done this. We could have tore it up. And, you know, and... They talked about how some of Undertaker's best matches were working with smaller men like Shawn Michaels, Rey Mysterio, they still put put in. You know, he, he admits he, he understands that dynamic really good. That was always his best matches, he felt, with that storytelling of big man versus little man. And so you're seeing parts of this where he's working with some of the bigger guys at NXT to give him back at the Performance Center. You can see it's kind of winding down all for him. And he doesn't even know if he wants to do the AJ Styles match. He's thinking he's not. And then Michelle, his wife, is talking to him, and she's like, you know that's one guy who's going to give you the career you want to go out on. That's the match you want. And she's like, he's like, damn it. He's like, you're talking me into this. So they decide they're going to do the match. He calls Vince, and then he convinces Vince to rib AJ Styles at first and tells Vince calls him up and says, yeah, it says he wants you to know we're going to do the match, but he's got this kid in Tennessee he wants to put over, a real big guy. I think we're going to do something with him. And hey, it's like, bullshit. We are not doing that. You know? mm. He said, yeah, they tried to get me, but they might have got me. <laughs> I wasn't convinced. The one so. question I have is, do they address that send-off at WrestleMania? That would have been the perfect send-off with leaving the boots in oh, the ring. Oh, yeah. They talked about that in one of their earlier episodes. He admits that was kind of his plan. And then he went back and watched that match. And, you know, he wasn't in the shape to really compete and have a good match that year. And he said it was his mistake. He shouldn't have gone out there like that. And it was just brutal to watch. And he said Roman was a complete gentleman about it, never brought it up. But he said he always believed that had to be difficult for him. And he said it was just not the way he wanted to go out. So that was his, that's kind of when it starts really chasing it, chasing it down for him, that last match. Okay. Because to me, if it, I just don't know why you do that in the ring if you didn't know it was a bad match because that's almost like the perfect send-off. And I'm having a hard time believing that he's even retired at this point because you do a whole network special to kind of set up your retirement and you're even leaving it open that you might come back at a later point. So Yeah, no, there's definitely that room. I will say this. They obviously they addressed the COVID stuff and everything too and how this turns into like a cinematic match. And he says, it wasn't how I expected this to go down, obviously. But he says, when it's good, you know it's good. And he said, I said, we knew we had something special. And I will say this. I don't necessarily think he's retired yet either, Joe. I was talking about this with AJ before we recorded today. And he's not buying it either. Uh, but that being said, I will, give, I will say this. 
if you follow the documentary and you look at the career of The Undertaker, if he was going to go out, going out in a cinematic match like the Boneyard match, kind of almost the perfect ending for him, too. If you're not, obviously the boots and the hat and the ring are perfect, but this is also a really good way to end that career, I think, too. That being said, gun to my head. This man ain't, this man's got one or two more matches in him. That's all I'm saying. That's what I think. I think, I think he has that WrestleMania if there's fans. Now, if there's not going to be fans back for another year or so, this might be it. Okay, because for me, The Undertaker's got to be one of my favorite all-time characters. The only time I ever dressed up as a wrestler for Halloween, it was a homemade Undertaker costume. I I haven't watched the documentary because it's hard for me to see him as Mark versus as The Undertaker. I did watch the Stone Cold one, but I, to me, it's just that kind of character that I enjoy what he's been. So watching these later matches is hard. And then even thinking of him retiring is kind of difficult. So I, I think it's just a weird spot to be in. And I just wanted to bring it up because I'm such a fan. And it's like, what, today's news pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Not counting a lot of the other scandals and stuff going on. But, uh, we won't talk about it here. We'll be the escape for people. Just I, I On the one hand, I think it is important. Like, we did have to mention Black Lives Matter. Sure. This the speak out movement is huge because people have gotten away with things for so long. And even though it's taking down wrestlers that we're personally fans of, like former guest David Starr, some pe people, yeah, a lot of people, Legero, Jordan Devlin, just to name a few, Matt Riddle. Mm -hmm. Matt, R I do want to say something because I was going to say, you know, we do have to remember, don't, how do we word this? Don't condemn anybody yet either at the same time don't don't knock anybody like we just need to let everything kind of play out here and just by all means any of these women who are going through a hard time or men in the rare case feel brave speak out you got support but at the same time too we do have to kind of watch out like in the case of matt riddle there's already been some documents and stuff coming out there's a history yeah there, there's, there's some things but just getting down yeah. to like the heart of it i mean it is yeah. innocent until proven guilty in this country right. which a lot of the times we forget about when names get out there, but the important thing is just like with black lives matter that the people like the women that feel like they didn't have a voice before that they get a chance to speak now. And that's as much as we want to get into it because yeah. that's way above our pay grade. <laughs> 100%. Plus uh, but people have heard about the bit that won't be mentioned for a little bit going on. Dave's popping. We know Jesse in New Hampshire is popping. Yeah. I mean, well, I, Randy still thinks we're drunk because we ran with it for so long. I mean, who's to say? I couldn't see you. <laughs> hey, let's do like any first date and let's leave it on an awkward note. And we're. I wanted to transfer to the Undertaker one more time. Hold okay. On. Well, what do you got to say about the Undertaker, bro? First, uh, one other thing, too, about that broken soul rant. Interview. I just want to just a quick sidebar. If anybody ever wanted to like has any interest in that, there's a great story about his first match he ever had with Bruiser Brody on that. Which I just think it's hilarious. I won't even say it. I'll just tell people check it out. And the other thing is, this documentary is really done well. And like Joe's a huge fan. I think most of the people I know are huge fans of Undertaker. Me and AJ are actually more fans of the American Badass gimmick. We're a little older and. I'm not like a big fan of the supernatural thing. However, the greatest gimmick wrestler of all time, that might sound like a backhanded compliment, but it's not. The greatest gimmick character wrestler of all time is The Undertaker. Because it's not really a believable gimmick, but there's nobody that ever worked harder at making it believable and making you suspend disbelief than Mark Calloway, The Undertaker. So he's got my respect. Dave, this is one of the few times we're going to actually disagree because... I'm a huge Undertaker fan. Scott has busted my balls about being a huge Kid Rock fan. But mm. when The Undertaker goes to a biker gimmick and comes out to either Kid Rock or Limp Biscuit, get the fuck out of here. If Mark Calloway's coming out, it's Bells, it's The Gong, it's Druids. You're not giving me this... Uh, this American badass. And... The Keep devil, rolling, rolling. the devil without a cause record, one of Kid Rock's first biggest, one of my favorites. 
Right. I was even a Limp Biscuit fan from the first couple albums. Sorry, but sorry. That, I just I can't put that behind The Undertaker. That's just me personally. That's you and probably 90% of the people. I do want to point out, when I say me and AJ, I literally mean me and AJ are probably like 2% of the population. Mm. I <laughs> mean, and me and AJ disagree a lot of things. People know this podcast. That's just a rare thing we happen to have in common. I think there's a few people, but most people are very much into The Undertaker character. I want to say Jesse from New Hampshire and maybe Sheaf are also into the American Badass gimmick, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, okay. And I've heard some, but I know we're in the minority, though. I know it just by, if you look at the overall body of work and people's response. But, yeah. All right, so i got a few people in my corner. You're damn right. Mitch South Wrestling, baby. Bring that. He would have been a great fit, that American Badass at Mitch South. All right, Dave, how do you want to end this Undertaker segment, bud? I think there's only one way to do it. Working fans podcast. Rest in peace. Sorry, that was awful. Go ahead, guys. Hi, wrestling fans. This is Mr. Number One, George South, longtime NWA legend, and you're listening to Working Fans Podcast. Yeah. It's just like the boogie woogie man, Jimmy Valiant, who sure. just, I think, turned 76 years old, and here in the Carolinas, he's still, uh, now he, he, he'll do a special referee or a manager, but right before this fire was hit, Dave, he showed me his book, his date book. Now, he's 76 years old, been in the business decades, and he's still booked every weekend. Now, what a testament to, he doesn't force his way on people. They call him, you know, to book him. And that's all I want out of my career. Man, I, I just want people to still want to be around me yeah. at that age, Dave. But ain't that something that, like I'll ask some of these young wrestlers sometimes, can they come and just say hey to a little kid or something? And mm-hmm. they look at me like it, it was a, the dumbest thing in the world I could ask. And, and so my question, you know what I learned in our, in our wrestling business? I tell these kids, it ain't how you start, it's how you finish this thing. They, there's a lot of wrestlers that started with hopes and we're going to change the wrestling world. And now we don't, what happened to them? For whatever reason. Mm-hmm. So I believe that with all my heart. I, you know, I taught that to Cedric and, and you know, also Tessa. You know, oh, my gosh. I, I, I was able to train her, and uh, I'm so proud of her, Dave. You know, you know what's amazing about training wrestlers, kids? I trained Ricky Steamboat's son, mm. Bobby Eaton's son, and people think just because your dad was good that you're supposed to be good. And that's, that's nuts. Because the pressure, you wouldn't believe the pressure that is on these kids before they ever get in the ring, that they expect you. I was sitting at an autograph signing with Rick Flair's son, Reed, the one that passed away, yeah. bless his heart, man, I love that kid. And, and we sat there for about an hour, Dave, and a and, and hundred people come up and every one of them said, how's your dad? How's your dad? Mm. How's your dad? And after about 40 minutes, I stopped one of them and I said, excuse me, sir, can you ask Reed how he's doing? (laughs) Simple common courtesy. Well, you know, when Tessa got in, everybody thought Chloe had trained her. When Tessa came to me, she'd never been in a ring in her life. Mm. Never. And she just busted her butt. Everybody else would would train two in three hours and they'd leave and she'd want to stay. So, so if nothing else, I'm so proud. I'll tell you a funny story, Dave, and I promise I'm going to shut up. No, I love it. Keep going, Josh. <laughs> when Cedric signed his WWE contract, he was so excited. And so he called me, and I was kind of, you know, joking with him. I said, Cedric, I said, yeah, all that money's good. I said, but you know me. I said, until I can walk in Walmart and see you hanging on the wall, <laughs> then you had never really made it, you know? <laughs> And he started laughing. Of course, I was talking about his action figure. Right. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, and, and so it was funny. And then, can you believe that maybe a month later, I go to my mailbox, and he sent me a package. <laughs> it was his action figure. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. You know, so, so now I tell everybody, yeah, Cedric made it. I, you can go to Walmart, you know, and see him hanging on the wall. Hey. So. And you know what? You trained him. He's obviously a good kid. And, you know, hey. Things are tough right now, and the WWE made a lot of cuts. They didn't cut Cedric. They sure did. They didn't cut Cedric, though. He kept his job, and I think there's got to be something yeah. to that. You know, like that's. Well, you know, I'm hoping that it, we've all. I mean, no, you know, I tell everybody, everybody's got to relax, man, because we've never dealt with this 
this plague. No, no, nobody thinks we're supposed to know how to act with this. And the, and everybody says, well, what, how do you feel about the shows without people? And, and the only thing I may not like about it, Dave, the, the wrestlers still have to eat. See, what nobody understands is sure. when this is all you do for a living, and, and it stopped. We didn't have, you know what's funny is we didn't have a say in it. And they like me and you wrestled, Dave, and we tore up a high school gym, and they said don't ever come back. You know, that was our fault. This way, this is not our fault. Right. And so the only thing I'm hoping, and not just in wrestling, but with all sports and everything, that I just hope people don't get comfortable, you know, just sitting at home. And, and what I mean by that, Dave, is yeah. I got a buddy of mine that just, in the wrestling business, he just did an online auction from his living room, and he made like six grand. Yeah. I mean, why would he ever go to a show and buy a dinner table? No. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. Yeah, like I'm, working, you know? I'm working now. I deliver bread, and I'm busier than ever. But I talked to some people who were telling me about other people that were unemployed right now, but they were giving them, like, bonus money, and it was, like, $1,300 a week. And I'm, I'm glad we're taking care of you, but I'm like, man, who wants to go back yeah. to work? You're sitting at home and just making all that oh, money. Oh, I'm telling you. Yeah. That's what I'm afraid of, buddy. Sorry. I mean, I'm serious. Uh, my, I got twin girls. My daughters are 21, and one of them does hair. And, it, and, and doing hair is almost like the wrestling business. They, you know, you got to wait for them to open you back up. And, yeah. and so she's filed for unemployment, and, and I laugh at her because and I'm glad she was able to get it, but you're right. thinking, why would anybody leave the house? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, you don't have to deal with people. Yeah. You know, my buddy in the wrestling business, he'll never deal with another promoter. Mm. He'll just sit at home in his pajamas with his phone, and do online auctions. <laughs> and I'm there, but I don't think that's a good thing, you know? So we'll no. see. I, I, mean, I know, you know, it's a tough call for anybody, but, you know, I'm glad the wrestlers are still getting to work, and, and you know, we'll, nobody knows how to handle this. We, we will know maybe next time, you know, if something comes along like this, but we've never, you know, when it first happened, man, I thought, yeah, we'll be shut down. Like here in Carolina's, it's become a joke, Dave, because the weightlifting gyms are still closed. Mm. So they hadn't opened our gyms, but they, they've opened up like swearing pools. So, cool. I mean, so you got everybody here laughing that, you know, you can go pee in a pool, but right. you can't go pee in a weightlifting gym. Right. You know? Right, right, yeah. So, that doesn't make any sense. Huh. Well, George, I love your enthusiasm. You've been awesome. We even went a little bit over the half hour, which is great. I'd love to have you back down the road. Oh, oh buddy, anytime. What? Tell us what, anything you want to promote or talk about. Finish up. Well, you know, I've got my school. If they if they want to go, the fans want to go to georgesouth.com. I'm still very old school. I've got a website, and, and it leads them to everything. In other words, I've got my book that I'm very proud of, me and Mark James wrote, and it's it's on there, So that, and my school. So they can go to georgesouth.com and email me if they've got any questions. I mean, autograph pictures. So that kind of is the first step. They can go on there. Excuse me, and then it'll lead them to anywhere else, you know, that they may want to go. I, you know, and it's, it's funny because even now with these gyms, we're, we're still, my wrestling school, we're still, we're not open full time yet, but right. we're still talking to, but here's, here's one last lesson real quick, Dave, yeah, and I think this is about, this describes your South. Yeah. This man called me and said, I give people tours of my school. You know, mm-hmm. before I sign you up, you're able to come in and meet me and see the school. So this man, this is last week. This man asked me, can he come and see my school? So I, I let him. He comes in. He sees the ring. He meets me. I mean, I'm not, I mean, he was like a professional looking guy. I mean, he wasn't, he looked like he was like, you know, had some sense. So he loved it. We talked about him signing up when things open back up. Four days go by, Dave, and he calls me again. He said, do you mind if I get one last look at your school? I said, no. I said, I'll be there today cleaning up. Come on down. He said, well, what's the address? <laughs> Dave, I wouldn't give it to him. <laughs> I said, no. I, if this man can't, I don't want him. I mean, uh, you know, he probably had $10,000 to give me, you know, to support my ministry, you know, my ministry. But I, being that aggravated me. You're trying to tell me, I must not have left a good impression on him, yeah. Dave. But I'm thinking, your first sip in wrestling is paying attention, buddy. Right. And... If you, if, I didn't even get to give him a broom. He couldn't even find my school. 
Nate? I mean, at this day and age, too, you could have just looked it up online or could just, just put it Oh, in. my gosh. <laughs> and see, I, I felt like, buddy, all you got to do is Google my name. Right. You but had, had, had to get not... towns and a map back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I took a, uh, one of my students to a West Virginia town uh, about two months ago, and we literally had to stop. We couldn't find a building because there was no cell phone service. There was no GPS service. So one of my new students, he said, what are we going to do? I said, pull over to this gas station. He said, huh? <laughs> I said, no, no, you're going to run in and ask them where the, where the, you know, this school is. So he goes in, Dave, and it was so beautiful. He goes in and asks this old lady where the school is. She takes the back of a receipt off of the register, <laughs> and she draws him a map. <laughs> I, she said, go up here to the church and hang a right, go to the second light. So she draws this thing, and he, he went and He'd never seen anything like that, yeah. Dave. And, and so that was like his, I told him, that was our GPS, you know, back in the day, buddy. But he thought he showed everybody. He thought that was like the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> that, awesome. she, that she wrote it on the ship on the back of her receipt, man. That's how we used to have to find the towns, buddy. But, but anyway, I, I appreciate your time, Dave. I, I, man, I, I get excited. And, Jordan, uh, I, want to ask you, I, I actually forgot. I wanted to ask you, are you involved with a podcast, too? You know what? I, I do a lot of them, which I'm so thankful for. And I never, like, I just did one with uh, Shane Douglas, which was so cool. Yeah. You know, I love doing them, and I need to learn to shut up so they can ask questions. Yeah. But I get very excited when... I love that. Uh, That's great. I had questions here today. I threw them out the window. I think we covered most of them, but... I no, listen, I, I'm serious. Dave, you ask me, let's do this before we end. Uh, ask me, well, I promise... I'll, I'll answer them quick. So if there's anything else, I've got plenty of time, buddy. I mean, I'm, don't you rush. You got most of them. I'll ask you one. Let's see one I might have missed here. Oh, how was the StarCast event? Making the Stars, I believe it was called. Oh, oh yes. Man, I, that too was was unbelievable for me because it sounds corny, Dave, but when I get to do shows like that, it's really like going home for me. Mm. I mean, it is because some of these guys, like I saw Sting, up there, and I hadn't seen Steve in years, and, and, but you know what was funny is, uh, gosh, I can't think of his name, but it wasn't Orange Cassidy, but it was one of these young kids that, he's on a AEW right now, but he actually came up, I, I don't, you know, I know the old guys, but anyway, this young kid was so respectful, he wanted to meet me, so he comes up to my table, I kind of wish I could think of his name, he's like Jericho's second, uh, right here, man, oh, right uh, now. Sammy Guevara? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep. Listen, he come up to my table, and I tried to sell him a book. <laughs> and so, listen, he asked, can he get a picture? And I said, sure. So we take it, and I forgot all about it. Well, the next day, my phone rang off the hook. People were saying, oh, my gosh, where did you meet him? Where did you meet him? I said, what are you talking about? But I guess he posted it on his, like, Instagram account. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it went, I mean, 10,000 views. I mean, 100,000 people watched and saw that picture, you know? That's awesome. And so I'm learning to, you know, be more observant to who's around me, you know? But that's where we did that at. He came up to me at uh, that StarCast. And, and he got to see Justin Rowe, but he couldn't tell you one last story about StarCast. Mm. I had not seen, this is how special wrestling is to me, Dave. I had not seen Jim Crockett since he sold the Crockett territory here in Charlotte and moved to Texas. I had not seen him or spoke with him. That day at StarCast, they had catering and before the doors opened. So I go downstairs. It's just me and the beautifulest catering table you've ever seen. And I'm, I got plans to eat till I get sick. <laughs> All of a sudden, the back door opens. I couldn't have wrote this better. And look, it's Jim Crockett. <laughs> and I hear this voice, my back's turned, I hear this voice say, George South, Dave, I promise you, it took me back to working for Jim Crockett Promotions here in Charlotte. And I turn around, and then we hugged each other, and it was so, that was worth it for me. And you know what I did, Dave, and, and I'll end it with this. I took 10 minutes. He thought I was nuts. But I said, Jimmy, I just want to thank you for everything that you did for me. Because as a kid, as a kid here in Charlotte, the Carolinas, it was Jim Crockett Promotions. I mean, it was, that was the big show in town. And to be able to wrestle for him and have him, you know, he took my family and, and signed my paychecks and, 
And he, I mean, I think it was very emotional for him that I did that. But, I, man, I just felt so good the rest of that weekend that I took time to just thank him for that after all these years. So, But, you know, a testament to my career, Dave, this is it. I promise. I'm shutting up after this so we can go. Chris Jericho just did a cruise right before this virus hit. Yep. He did a cruise out in the middle of the ocean. One of my buddies from high school went and was on the boat. Jericho has Ric Flair as a guest on his podcast. So when Rick walked out, Jericho said, Rick, I just want you to know that my claim to fame is that I'm the only man that's ever been beat by your figure four. <laughs> and what he meant by that is usually a guy rolls over, you know, somebody right. will reverse it. Flair's hardly ever beat anybody with it, but Flair stops him Dave, right in the middle of it and says, no, 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 let me correct you. You ain't the only guy. It's you and George South. Ah, <laughs> so my car, my buddy, as soon as they got to land, you know, they, they docked. My buddy got on his phone and says, you can believe this. We're in the middle of an ocean somewhere. And Rick Flair mentioned your name. But here's the thing, Dave. My buddy said, because they don't really know the business. He said, was that a good thing or not? <laughs> I said, are you kidding me? That's a great thing. After all these years, Flair still remembers that he beat me with the figure four. That's like the greatest. That's like my Hall of Fame speech, 100%, Dave. 100%. <laughs> oh, my man. That's what means something to me. So. George, this was absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. Well, Dave, thank you so much for your time, buddy. I didn't, man, I get carried away, and I hope I, I hope I didn't take up all of your day. No, no, but, no, uh, no. Great memories, man. Yeah. Great, just fun and... All right, guys, welcome back for another week of the 531, where we take a top five list on a particular subject, debate it down to a top three, and then according to the maker of this theme song, it does not go down to a top one. There is no such thing as a top one. It's the king of the hill, the man that wears the crown, the number one stunner, the top person that AEW should cut, according to this week's list. So this week, obviously, I buried the lead there that it's the top five people AEW should cut. And Jake got us a list first. He has Colt Cabana, Frankie Kazarian, QT Marshall, Peter Avalon, and Marco Stunt. What do you think about that list? I feel like these lists are going to be like just people that people don't like. Frankie Kazarian was an odd choice for me because... I mean, I wouldn't cut Colt Cabana, but I could see maybe where you think he's not as yeah, big. Yeah, Kazarian's huge. QT Marshall, obviously, is, I would say, an expendable name. Peter Avalon, I feel like he's got potential that he's not living up to. Because I heard a lot about him in championship wrestling from Florida. And he's been just a comedy, like, opening match player on so far. Championship wrestling from Florida or Hollywood? Championship wrestling for Hollywood. I fucked that up. Yeah, you know, honestly, I think his thing about Peter Avalon, though, I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'll give Jay, Jay a break on this because look at people who should cut. It's basically based off what they're doing with him right now, and they're not doing anything with him right now. So although he has more potential, eh, you know what? Based off what they're doing, I can see why that's a good choice. The only one I would have disagreed with maybe was like you, maybe Frankie Kazarian. That seemed to be an odd choice, but uh, may, maybe he's not an SCU guy. Maybe he sees Daniels as kind of the mentor of that group and Scorpio Sky is the young gunner. Here's the thing, I liked it, but I would have took Daniels out because he's the one who's been around longer. Yeah. And, I mean, you can always give him a backstage job. But anyway. The next list we got is from Mike Flynn. He's got Austin Gunn, QT Marshall, Michael Nakazawa, Peter Avalon, and Luther. There were comments next to all of these, but I didn't put the comments as much. I know Luther, I believe he said he didn't really know what his role in the company is. I think when the Nightmare Collective was a thing, he added a nice twist to it. And the reason he has a job, Mike, is because he's a close friend of Jericho's. I, I mean, I think he adds something, but... I'll give you, I'll give you, I'm looking at it right here. Austin Gunn. Yep. Long kind of heat. QT Marshall. Maybe he's a good producer, but he's awful, boring, and I changed the channel. Michael Nakazawa, not my thing. 
Peter Avalon. We didn't really get. I can agree with that with Nakazawa because yeah, I do too. the baby oil thing. It's funny, but it's kind of a little too heavy-handed. It's too WWE heavy-handed. Look. It's almost like something WWE would do on Raw. Or something. Yeah, something like shitty that, that they. Would That's do. what I mean. It's something like oh. I mean, I hate to say that because I had so many great members of WWE growing up. But when I say it was something WWE would do, that's usually what I mean. It's like, yeah, that's shit. Yeah. If I say something like Triple H and NXT would do, I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> that might be a better thing. Now, next up on the list, we got Jesse from New Hampshire, and he's got Jimmy Havoc, Doctor Luther, Sean Spears, Orange Cassidy, and Michael Nakazawa. Yeah, man. I feel like there's so much potential with Sean Spears, and I'm really sad that... Uh, you think he's going to live up to that leather, leather glove gimmick? Yeah, I, I was listening to uh, Post do a thing like that. They are talking about that. And, like, if most of your fans, you know, had, like, you know the history of that glove for years, that probably really didn't make a lot of sense to people. You imagine not knowing that, and you're like, you gave him a fucking glove. What the hell's that? Yeah, what's this old man giving this dude a glove without finger? Without finger. But that was a great promo by Tully, by the way. I don't know if you saw it Tully. I still have not seen uh, it. I only saw, like, the tail end of where he was yelling at him. Tully's, like, basically talking about, you know, forget about the search for your tag partner. Did you know they were doing that for a little while? Yeah. Right. So Tully's like... It was a good thing they pulled the WWE move and just let that storyline die. Yes. Whatever it was. Yes, I like that. I, I didn't mean that as a compliment, uh, but... No, but, but I, actually, I, I, I'm glad they died. I mean, some storylines do need to be let go when you're trying to force something with a guy. Here's the difference with them, too. They did this with the Nightmare Collective thing, too. They eventually addressed it in a small way on YouTube, and totally addressed this, too, in that interview. Oh, okay. So he basically said with the tag team that he said, we're not doing that anymore. Now, that's a small way of doing it. He's basically saying, he's like, we're going to talk legacy and where your head's at. It's a way of addressing it rather than going with one storyline and then the next week. Yeah. Being in a storyline, but heading in a weirder direction. What they're doing basically is they're basically just giving you a little tidbit here. Just like for the hardcores that are looking for it. Like here, we're wrapping this up. You almost have to be a hardcore to like AEW because it feels like if you want the complete storyline, you got to be watching their AEW Dark. You got to be listening to the podcast. You got to be watching the show. You got to be watching Road 2. You got to be watching Being the Elite. definitely give you more if you watch all that stuff. I like that, though, because it fills out a bigger picture. If you just want to watch the wrestling, the wrestling's on TV for you. You want to delve into the storyline, they've got it. I have to add this before I forget. I got the part with Tully, basically, he's yelling at him. And he's like, basically, he's like, you have to understand. He said, what am I thinking? He says, I'm getting ready to watch Double or Nothing with my friends, gather around and watch Shaw's Spears, and I see my face on your crotch. He's like, do you think that's what I want to see? He's like, I don't know about your legacy, but I'll be damned if that's my legacy. He's like, we need to figure out where you're at right now. And then the next day. God damn, I got to watch that. That almost makes his face on his crotch worth it. I guess that that seems like a weird thing to say about Tully Blanchard. Former guest of the show, Josh Dunn from Rock and Randy's Rock and Wrestling Group, came up with Brian Cage, Evil Uno, Brandon Cutler, Jake the Snake, and Michael Nakazawa. Now, there were comments that followed this, and I just remember him saying that, uh, Josh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I believe it was more or less, he's just never found him to be an exciting wrestler. Cage is good, but if you're not into that big man style of match, I can see why you might not be into him as much. Yeah, I really, I find Cage fine, but I, I'm not like blown away. I actually think they did him a big favor by putting Taz in him. Like, I find oh, it yeah. because of Taz. Like, if he just came in and, like, as Brian Cage, he was doing an impact wrestling, yeah, okay. But he's going to be just a guy. Oh, what do you see? How do you see that match with him and Moxley ending up at Fighter Fest? Moxley's going to win that, and there's going to be something that goes down with Darby. I feel like the feud's going to be Darby and Cage because of what's going on with Taz. It's, okay. That's I mean, what I, I think. I don't think we're taking the title off it yet. I would hope they wouldn't, but I was getting worried that it'd be like, let's get Cage in there, let's get the title on him. Almost like happened in Impact. I mean, you never know. Like Even when uh, Brody Lee shouts for the belt, I wondered if they would try to hot shot something. I mean, they did it, but you know, when you're a new company... Wow, see, I didn't think about that because you've got two debuting people that are going up against the champion... And for some reason, I saw it as more likely that Brian Cage would get the title versus Brody Lee. But when you put it like that way, why wouldn't you just kind of introduce him and just have him mow down a new guy and start a new rivalry off of that? Evil Uno, I think, even if you took the Super Smash Brothers out of the Dark Order, 
you could take him and Stu Grayson out, and I think he'd be fine. Not a bad choice. I mean, Brandon Cutler, he's not bad, but... I mean, you got to have a certain amount of job, guys, so that's where I think the QT Marshalls, the Brandon Cutlers, sadly, the Pineapple Peets come in. I hate to see it, but... Hey, I'll say it again. We're not doing it, man. Michael Nakazawa popping up on a list again. Feel bad for that guy. <laughs> Michael Campbell brought us a list from the Rock and Randy's Rock and Wrestling group, and he's got Michael Nakazawa, Joey Janela, Leva Bates, and Dr. Luther. Now, Jason D'Augustino from Rock and Randy's Rock and Wrestling Group had Joey Janela, Marco Stunt, Michael Nakazawa, Jimmy Havoc, and Riha. We're gonna have a clear number one this week, but <laughs> anyway. Yeah, there's one. There's, there's one, one very there. consistent performer. Now, Larry Hamill, he's got a list of okay. from the dead. <laughs> Love that guy. Anyway, he's got a list of he's got three names on his list, but we got two tag teams. He's got the hybrid two, so that's Angelico and Jack Evans. The Beaver Boys, John Silver and Alex Riley. A former guest, yep. Yeah. And Sonny Kiss. I want to disagree with this list so much, but I mean, they haven't done as much with the hybrid two as I feel like they've could have. I mean, maybe a lot of dark matches. What they did in Lucha Underground, what they've done in Triple A. And Helico has a lot of potential. Oh, yeah. Nothing is Jack Evans either. It's great. And the Beaver Boys, I, oh yeah, I mean, I was pumped when they went in. I feel like they've been underused, but I mean, they've got regular contracts, so you can't really fault them for that. It, it's a tough list. But moving on to Albert Bettis from Rock and Randy's Rock and Wrestling Group. He's got Joey Janela, Eva Luno, Marco Stunt, Chuck Taylor, and Orange Cassidy. Granted, some of these lists, I feel like. I don't want to like put words necessarily in their mouth, but I, I feel like they're almost in that Cornette camp where they're not Janela fans. So it's the Janela, the best friends, kind of more the jokey, yeah. less serious wrestlers. Yeah, the yeah. Right? that's what it goes down to. That's what you're gonna get with a list like this. You're gonna get people that just people just don't like. We're not asking you to like put aside what a list like this too. Like, okay, put aside your feelings and tell us like you know. Who do you legitimately think is the best? You're just telling us, I want you to get that guy. I don't really like that guy. Yeah. So it's like, okay. Talking about not liking that guy, we got Randy's list is up next. And, I mean, very similar to some people, Randy had Luther. He had Private Party. Yeah, weird week for that choice. We got Peter Avalon, Awesome Kong, and Big Swole. Yeah, a little odd pattern there. But, I mean, why do you see... A private party, I was very surprised to see he thought they should get the boot because underutilized, but I mean, they've got that potential. And yeah, I mean, I, I did, again, we're talking about personal preference, whatever he just doesn't seem to like the private party. I don't know what it is, but that's his preference. We'll address AJ's list because AJ feels it's too soon to cut anyone from AEW, yeah. and I don't think AJ's watched Dark. Oh, he definitely is not. Because if you would watch Dark, you would say, yeah, we got a portion of this roster we can cut. Now, this isn't to say we want anybody to be out of a job necessarily. I mean, I'm not speaking for everybody. So, some people Sometimes could be coming at this with hate in their hearts. But I've, I've got to make a list of who I think could be cut. And I'm really going to start with Eva Luno. Because, I mean, even though those guys started off the Dark Order, I feel like it's kind of what they've do done has gone out. Their importance has gone out the door once Brody Lee came in. Sure. Obviously, Michael Nakazawa is going to be next on the list. After Michael Nakazawa, I'm going to have to cut QT Marshall because, I mean, he does serve that jobber role. But he, he's almost been, like, I don't want to say over-featured for his position, but, like, he's gotten a lot of air time for somebody that kind of is well, if you're not watching like all the road to stuff yeah. like he's been talking to diamond dallas page i don't know if you've seen this no. page is teaching him the diamond cutter like they're they're coming up with stories for him. like they're mm -hmm. actually good. and dude, i don't know if you picked up on this because it was on dark but it actually happened very briefly on raw the bunny remember the butcher the blade and alley the bunny yeah she's no longer with the butcher and blade she's stalking qt marshall she was eating an apple and i noticed there was something yeah, going on yeah. with them and aside, and that died of speaking of the butcher and the blade how ready are you for ftr versus butcher and yeah. the blade wednesday yeah. the fact that ftr doesn't have a contract makes me a little just a little concerned 
going into matches. Like, I hope they're not there just to put people over because I definitely think, like, they got to win that match. Now. I don't know. Did you hear them on Cornette at all? I haven't heard that yet. Oh, wow. They talked about almost having real heat with the Bucks over the whole feud. And it almost sounded like a kayfabe interview, but saying, like, eventually we could get in the ring with them, but, like, we don't know what we're going to do. Like, there is still some bad feelings that are going to come out. So, and they made it sound like they didn't come in specifically just to do jobs. Check out that Cornette interview. It's very interesting. I got to come up with two more people that should be cut. I am going to make the bold move. And I don't even know if I want to say we should cut Jim Ross. Oh, you know what I would say before that? Cut Alex Marvez. Oh, wow. See, I would think keep Alex Marvez for the backstage and just do Shivani, Excalibur, and Taz as your commentary. But Okay. I'll tell you what. Post put over Ross and Shivani recently. Yeah. And if you look back, remember when Ross did that interview with or- Ortiz? Was Ortiz or Santana? Santana. I, I can't remember who's who, but it, yeah, it was about his uh, father being yeah, blind. Serious. They got that over there. Ross has done some good things, but I feel... I'm not going to get into this to criticize Ross. I'm just going to... I'm going to choose an announcer because I feel like if you had like a tight booth of Excalibur, sure. Tony Schiavone, and Taz with like Alex Marvez as a backstage guy, that's nothing against Jim Ross. No, I just no. wanted to make like a different... Hey. And the other now Justin News was where this is kind of a little off topic. But Tony is really good with the casual sit downs, like with FTR. There's different uh, things. Okay, do you have all five? No, I've got one last person I got to cut from AEW. Did we, did we mention Scott's list? We did not mention Scott's list yet. I'm going to cut Marco Stunt because I feel like the Jurassic Express team just have Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, and you would be good. You wanna you wanna find Scott's list for us for a second? Sure, we're live, pal. <laughs> Usually we're a little better organized than this, but you guys know we're the working fans. We do this after work. Busy fucks. Yeah, you gotta see the racks of bread Dave has in his car right now. Racks in my house. <laughs> Five people they should cut from Scott: Alex Marvis, Mel, Dark Order Jobbers Eight, Nine, and Ten. To which I responded, "How dare you!" Ten has potential, and I believe that he's doing either. <laughs> so who is four and five for him? Jobber, dark order jobbers, eight, nine, and ten. Oh, so that's what he did for three, four, and five? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you could take one of them out. All right. I mean, he's not wrong, that dark order. You have those henchmen, but, I mean, I don't think they... They're good for, like, that creep factor. But, like, you don't need them all the time, and I don't even think they should be featured that much. Pop up in a pay-per-view once in a while. Dave, we've debated this down, and we still have one list left to go, unless I forgot anybody. We got Jake, Zach, Mike. Oh, yeah, we got all the regulars. We got Randy. We didn't leave him off this list. Jesse, too, right? Jesse from New Hampshire. Sure, sure shit. Sent him out his box of gimmicks today that went out in the mail. Let's wrap this up here. We're all over the page from Scott. I'm going to take out Dark Order members 8 and 9. <laughs> all right. I'm also going to add... They're, they're going to be 1 and 2 on your list, 8 and 9? Yeah, I'm also going to add Mel, <laughs> which I think Scott might have mentioned Mel, too. I'm not sure what you're doing. Anything. Oh, yeah, she was number 2 on his list. Luther, I'm going to throw out there just because he's older, and he's kind of lucky to get in this spot right now. Put him, in a, put him as the manager of, like, Jimmy Havoc. Maybe get another deathmatch guy in there. I mean, That's the only way you could keep him in there and keep him relevant. Otherwise, to me, he just seems like that odd peg now that the Nightmare Collective's gone. He had that feud with Jimmy Havoc, too. It was mostly on Dark, but they had one match, I think. No, yeah, yeah I mean, that was on Dark, too. Yep, no, yeah, that makes sense. Who do you got as number five on your list? And number five, after careful consideration, mentioned so many times, I ended up going with Michael Naka, Naka, Naka Zawa. It makes all the sense in the world. Get world. that motherfucker off my TV. God damn, do you just want to make him the top one so we can get to the end? Or I mean, not the I'm top not. one, the number one choice of... No, I know what you mean. He's ultimately... Oh, no, we got to put it in there because Zach does not like the term top one. <laughs> and I have been... I've been shited about it a few times, so we're fixing it. So we got... Oh, geez, this kitten's falling off my lap. Get up here, Thor. This little motherfucker is fucking up production here. I'm watching him for one week. 
And he's like, a pound out some five three once. Yeah, and now he's attacking cords under our <laughs> feet. Oh. Oh, you can hear him there. Little motherfucker's trying to get a cameo. He's okay. Say he's hi to the people. Okay. Say hi to the people. Oh, now you're going to shut the fuck up. That's cool. All right, so who do we got next on the list under Nakazawa? A lot of Luthers. A lot of QT Marshalls. A couple of Evil Unos. Fuck, dude. QT Marshall, I know, popped up on a few. So. Does, but if you're watching, like, Dark and stuff like that, they're really trying shit with him. They're giving it. He has a winning record. Are they... Wow. Are they showing more promise with him than they are with Brandon Cutler? Because I feel like oh. they're almost on the same level. No. They're, showing, they're doing way more with him than Brandon Cutler. Brandon Cutler's only getting spots on the v and Elite show. Okay, which is probably, I mean, honestly, where he should be. Do you want to put, you want to take QT out and put Brandon Cutler in? Sure. Since, I'm not going to say that's what people were thinking, but it is that equivalent Listen, level of person. I'm not saying that QT probably shouldn't be at a lower level, but yeah. they're not treating him as such. No. So, yeah, I'll put Brandon Cutler in. All right, and then, shit, I mean, we could almost do... Receding hairline, motherfucker. Uh, yeah, it looks like the old hair club for men. Like, I don't know what they see in him, but they're keeping him around doing something with him. So who do you got, who do you want to put in that third spot? Because there's not a lot of people that show up on a lot of lists. I mean, Peter Avalon's on a couple. Private parties on one list. It's tied. Like, who the fuck cares about these two motherfuckers under a mask? Eight or nine. Ten to actually gave it me. Is that... Was the, was the, uh, so eight and nine are actually real people. Eight and nine, I have no idea who they are. But Ten. they they refer to them by eight and nine regularly. Yes. Yeah, they were on. How the like, fuck have I missed this? Uh, you gotta watch the call out AJ. You gotta watch Dark a little more too. I missed the last two weeks though. I was. Keeping hey, up. at least I'm not reading reviews of shows. So far, we we got Michael Nakazawa, Brandon Cutler, and shit. Do we just put AJ on the list for the top people? <laughs> <laughs> Well, AJ's this birthday this week, so happy birthday yeah, to AJ. Well, not by the time this airs. By the time we recorded Oh yeah, this. by the time we recorded this. So AJ's birthday was a couple weeks ago. Happy Don't birthday. worry. He can take a little ball busting. Yeah, he's fine. He will survive. He's, he's probably got he probably got it worse from his wife on his birthday than from us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're watching Ace Romero versus Tracy Williams. And there's friend of the show, Kristen, in the corner. And we still got to pick a third person to cut Dave. So you just want to pick a name out of a hat? Sure. You want to do Eva Luna? Eva Luna's fine. Or no, let's do Peter Avalon because we talked about him a couple times. And he showed up on multiple lists. We got Peter Avalon and Brandon Cutler fighting for top jobber. Well, you got Peter Avalon, Brandon Cutler, and Michael Nakazawa. Oh. Who's the first to get cut? The first to get cut, meaning the least likely to be cut, is Peter Avalon. He's got the most personality potential on it. But they're doing storylines with Cutler on Dark. Remember, that was kind of what boosted him. Are they doing anything with Avalon on Dark? They're doing stuff with Avalon on being the elite with Cutler, arguing over who's the worst jobber. <laughs> Avalon keeps heckling him and talking about how you suck. Maybe they just want to Google or they want to look up Working Fans Podcast on YouTube and they can find out who the top jobber is going to be because... I'm going to boo... Who do you think's got a better storyline? Since you're aware of everybody's lists, I, look at that cat out on the floor. He's been wild for so long. Now he's sleeping on Dave's list. I hope the uh, fans aren't sleeping on Dave's list, though. So between Peter Avalon and Brandon Cutler, whose stories in the supplemental material are you most into? Out of two, Avalon. Avalon has more. A A Avalon. And he has Leva, which I think uh, Leva does have potential. I think. Yeah, Brandon Cutler just has dun Dungeons and Dragons in the yeah, face. Yeah, he comes out dressing like his, you know, his mom made him some superhero clothes. Cool. Cool story, bro. Get the fuck out of here. All right, so after Avalon. So we got Avalon up against Michael Nakazawa. And let's remind people, we're competing for the worst. Like, who should get cut? Now, I'm going to save Cutler on this one. Because even though he's kind of You're going to say, we already bounced Cutler off the list. Oh. So it's like Nakazawa versus... No, 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 no. We bounced Avalon off the list because we're, 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 we're fight The two bottom ones are the two shits. Okay, okay. Remember? So yeah. We're picking worse. I wasn't thinking in opposites, I'm sorry. That's right. That's why I'm helping you out here. So Avalon survives because he's better than that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so now, it's Brandon now Cutler down versus Michael shit. Nakazawa. No offense, guys. I'm just trying to make it clear for our fans. I mean, do you want to stretch this out to a half hour and pretend like it's a competition, or do you just want to you just want to squirt baby oil all over this shit and let it slip through our fingers? It belongs on Monday Night Raw in a very bad way. Not like when I want to see Raw eventually become again, but like what it is now. 
get rid of him. <laughs> so, guys, I mean, you know what the music means. It means Michael Nakazawa is the top person that AEW should cut. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he is a good person, but I mean, the way they've represented him has been awful. <laughs> and guys, you know where to find us. The email is workingfanswrestlingpod at gmail.com. The Twitter is at fansworking. The Instagram is workingfanswrestling underscore pod. Dave and AJ Facebook page working fans podcast facebook page guys tell us what you think <laughs> all right have a good one all right so that wraps us up for this week thank you again for listening to the working fans podcast so as always you can find us on twitter at fans working our facebook page is working fans wrestling pod we have email where you can reach out to us and let us know what you think also that's working fans wrestling pod at gmail.com follow us on instagram working fans wrestling underscore pod and then as always please Continue to listen to us on Anchor.fm, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, all your major platforms. If you're following us on Apple Podcasts, which we are also on now, and YouTube, please make sure you subscribe and give us a five-star rating. It helps us bring you these podcasts where we get to talk to you and talk with you every week.